Welcome to Rebrand, where we're exploring what it means to rethink the ways we're doing ministry in the United Methodist Church. I'm Tim Jones, and that's Ben Smith. In today's episode, we're diving into a story of transformation within the UNC. This time, we're calling for a move from complacency to urgency. We'll discuss how this looks for the individual and as a denomination. How can we reevaluate our priorities, reinvigorate our congregations, and redefine what it means to be a church in the modern world? Now, in our last episode, we talked about what we can do to move from a survive mentality to a mindset of growth and explored what it means to be a thriving church. Today, we're going to go a step further and talk about the need for a sense of urgency in the way that we live our faith, and in seeking change in order to be a denomination that's making a difference in the kingdom. So stay with us as we reflect on our past, call out some hard truths, and envision a better future in the journey towards a more urgent and mission-focused faith. Ben! Timothy. You know, I don't know why I start so so many episodes just saying your name. You do, and then I always follow up with the, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, whatever. (laughs) Old man. Hey, uh, we, we kind of struck a nerve with the, the last Whoa, episode. It's been, it's been crazy. Yeah, yeah, getting a good feedback. Um, yeah. Uh, got a couple of emails that uh, just wanted to, to throw out there. and uh, Tell me what the people are saying. The peeps. Tell me what the... Nope. No? Wait, no, we... we uh, what, what are the rebranders? Tell me what the rebranders have to say. Okay. Uh, since we're their podcast pals, we're, pod pals. No, we're not. Oh. But they are the rebranders. Tell me what the rebranders are saying. All right. This one says Ben and Tim. That's the first mistake. It should always be Tim you know, it, and Ben. I, they, but They made no mistake. I, you know, okay. Ben and Tim, I'm a little late to the party. You know what? Better late than never, right? Yeah, the, parties, the party started because you, you joined. That's exactly right. Wait, the party started because you joined. You got to make eye contact. That was, we, got, we also get some critique. Some yeah. some constructive criticism, yeah. and I did. We got one that said, "I enjoy it when you look at the camera instead of your laptop." And I, they did say it in a positive way. I, they did. They, they really did mean it truthfully. So, yeah. I see you and I hear you. We don't see you, but <laughs> that's true. We, we, we know you your, see us. We see your your words. So, <laughs> thank you. All right, Ben and Tim. I'm a little late to the party, but I just started listening to the podcast. I absolutely love what you guys are doing with it. Oh. It has invoked so much thought for me and has really been pushing me to do more. Love that. That's that's what we're going that's, for. That's the point. And we really we appreciate you writing in and, and letting us know. Here's another one. Just wanted to reach out. Great episode. I watched the whole thing. That was a marathon. That was longest episode we've ever had, and and we are we're trying. We're going to try to shorten this one. Yeah, um, we'll we'll see how it goes. But they'll know before we do. I mean, <laughs> that's if I, exactly right now right. they know exactly how long it's going to be. We we don't. That's right. Yeah, uh, great episode. I watched the whole thing. I really like where you all are going this year, and uh, we've been really excited about the yeah. this season and and looking um, at some of the issues that we see within the UMC. Uh, and it's not something that we want to just harp on. We all see this. Uh, some of the other emails that we've gotten have been so glad that you're not tiptoeing around yeah. some of the the yeah. hard things that we need to talk about. And that's what we want to do. We want to talk about it. We want to call it out. But the purpose of these episodes is what can we do to get away from it? Yeah. And what can we do to move forward, to be healthier, uh, and, and to be thriving in, yeah. in ministry. And w- you know what I thought was cool is both of those uh, pieces of, of feedback that you that you read for us came from from people who represent different um, perspectives yep. or different groups of people yeah. um, in in our denomination. And both of them said, "Hey, this is something that I think is really important for us to talk about." And something that the people like me, I'm not going to call out who these people are, but right. the people like me, like. We need to be engaging on this topic too. And both of these people said, if you want to have, if you want to bring my perspective into the conversation, if I, if if there's a place for me to be a part of the conversation with you all, I'd love to do that. And we may just take you up on it. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, You know, we talked about that and, and, and both of these would be fantastic guests to to have on. So So, we're looking forward to it. With that said, if you think that, that you represent a unique, perspective, especially one that maybe maybe you think we haven't really addressed. Right. Maybe you think we have a bit of a blind spot and you want to provide a different perspective. I would 
love nothing more than to hear some difference of perspective. So hit us up, uh, rebrand at Holston.org, rebrand underscore pod on Instagram. Those are the two big ones, actually. That those You can DM us, you can email us. And we got a new one. A new we one sure with, do. With, with, with oh, what man, I missed that. Uh, you can now follow us on Facebook, Rebrand Podcast. Check it out. Uh, all the all the same great content uh, you get on Instagram, you can yep. get on Facebook. But we have this pesky little 90-second limit on Instagram reels. I can post a little, as long of a video as I want on Facebook. So, uh, you know, you get some some extended highlight cuts, some extended content on there. We also have started putting up some more additional content that yep. goes beyond what we talk about just on our episodes here. For instance, um, last week we put out a video celebrating Bishop Looney's 90th birthday. Yes. If you don't know Bishop Looney, he came out of Holston here. He served in, in, in across the southeastern jurisdiction. Um, he is a treasurer and a saint of of um, our conference, of our jurisdiction, of our denomination. I mean, and an unbelievable storyteller. Man, the guy is cool. And so we got to um, we got to sit down with him. So we shared some stories that he just had about his life and ministry in Holston. We filmed a bunch of other stuff with him, and we're going to be dropping more of that. Um, we were we decided we had a couple questions about yep. our episode today. Um, but we decided to hold off, maybe maybe dangle those in front of you and and keep you keep you waiting for those. We might put those <laughs> out a little bit later. Um, all kinds of extra content coming. Um, you can also find us on YouTube. Uh, some of that content was going to be going directly onto YouTube rather than on the website or on social. So make sure to smash that subscribe there button, you as go. the kids say. Um, on YouTube, you can search for us, Rebrand Podcast. There's a couple. Look, uh, there's a couple podcasts that have come up since we started our podcast that, that are like going by the name Rebrand. We're the original Rebrand That's Podcast. Right. Um, they may have more followers than us on on uh, <laughs> YouTube. I'll, I say that just you may have to scroll just a, <laughs> just a bit to find us. But you know, you you'll see the iconic the iconic uh, Rebrand logo. I don't have it around here to show you, but. Uh, the little speech bubble with the stripes, you know, you're loyal rebranders. And and what I hear you saying is you've just put a challenge out to our listeners and, yeah. and viewers that we, we can move back up to the top, but we need your help. Yeah. Let people know what's going on here. That's true. We're, we're coming for you, the rebrand on, <laughs> on, uh, on YouTube, 10,000 subscribers, Pff, whatever. Whatever. We'll get 11,000. That's right. Or someday. Yeah, one day, <laughs> one day. Last week, we talked about what it meant to move from a survive mentality, something that we're, we're just trying to make it to the next Sunday, to a thrive mentality where we are excited about the ministries, we're excited about discipleship, getting people involved. Today, we're talking about urgency. Yeah. And one of the things that I really want to dive into after we show a, an interview here in just a moment is... Uh, why it's important for us to have this sense of urgency. Because mm. one thing we love to do as United Methodist is what? Meet. Meet. And in those was that meetings... that the right answer? I, was, that wasn't scripted. It was, it was. And what do we do in those meet meetings? We, we talk, we talk, we talk, we, we legislate, yep. we plan. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes that yeah. ne- that's needed. But if all we do is talk, nothing gets done. And, and so we want to talk Amen. about moving from those vision meetings mm. to putting it into some practice and, and getting out and, and doing some things. But before we get to that, we want to uh, bring in Kim Goddard again. Yeah. Uh, she was a big hit on the podcast. Honestly, were, I'm, I'm a little scared because people seem to really like her a little more than they liked us. Uh, uh, I get them? it. No, I get it. Uh, I, I get mean, it. Yeah, yeah. So we're, bring, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's right. We're bringing her back. That's right. We're bringing her back. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the history, some of the present, and where we can go in the future. And so without further ado, Kim Goddard, everybody. Welcome back to Rebrand. We are here once again with Reverend Kim Goddard. She is district superintendent in the New River District. She's also the dean of the cabinet. She is the 
um, head of the delegation for clergy mm-hmm. uh, for this uh, this general conference uh, year, quadrennium, whatever we call it for, for that. But most importantly, she is a friend of the podcast. Yes. yes. We, we are just, again, we're so grateful to have you on. Uh, in our last episode, we were talking about what it means to move from a survive mentality to a thrive mentality in, in both the life of the church and also our lives as, as Christians. And, and today, as we continue this conversation, we want to talk about a sense of urgency. Mm-hmm. Uh, what does it mean to have a sense of urgency um, instead of one of complacency uh, when it comes to discipleship, when it comes to mission and ministry? So that that's going to be the topic for the day. Uh, Kim is also one of our great resident historians and <laughs> theologians, and we mm. always appreciate your knowledge when it comes to Wesleyan theology and and Wesleyan history. So uh, can you tell us, um, looking back in the days of Wesley, what a sense of urgency looked like and and kind of how they played into, or how that played into the Methodist movement? Well, I think, first of all, as the the Methodist movement started to, to grow and Wesley and others are doing the you know, the, the um, outdoor preaching, uh, what he called so vile <laughs> the first time he did it, <laughs> but they're, they're taking their, their message where the people are. Um, and then people wanted to, they wanted to know more. They wanted to be a part of uh, the small groups, the class meetings that were being established. And the one criteria for being a part of this Wesleyan movement the, the, or, and to join a class meeting was a desire to flee the wrath to come. Uh, if that doesn't speak to urgency, I'm, I'm not sure what what does. Do you do you desire to to flee the wrath that is coming? Then then you can be a part, and, and that was the only the only uh, criteria for for being a part of a, a class meeting was was that desire, that urgent desire. And uh, I remember then. Uh, Gosh, it's been a long time ago, but I've been around a long time. That's why I remember and know all of this history. I experienced a lot of it. <laughs> um, I remember being in Coburn in a strip mall uh, where I was driving by, and I saw a sign that said used books. Uh-huh. And because I love the Wesley history, I thought this is this is great for me. So I went in, and there was a there was an old gentleman in there who looked like he could have published a lot of those really really old books. <laughs> but he asked what my interest was, and I told him I would like to to look at the Methodist books. And he said, "Oh, Methodist." He said, "I guess you're a Methodist." I said, "Well, yes, I am." And uh, he said, "Well, my mother was a Methodist." And when I looked at him and tried to envision his his mother, I knew this was someone who probably grew up a, around in the early 1900s even. Wow. But he said when she, um, that she was converted in a Methodist church and um, they immediately put her in a class meeting. So that's continuing into the early 1900s at least as, as normative. And um, I said, oh, really, tell me about that. And he said, well, she she was in the class meeting, and they met once a week. They met in a circle, and they went around the circle, and they asked the question, are you living in victory? Mm. Ooh. And and every person had to tell how they were living in victory that week. And if there was a little question or doubt, they just stopped the meeting. Everybody gathered around, laid hands on that person, and prayed them through. <laughs> prayed until that person could say they they were living in victory. That's wow. urgent. Uh, that's saying this is you know this is a day to day week to week journey, um, and and it is a journey that is not about complacency but about about victory about knowing that yeah. you're you're growing and moving forward. So that was then, and then um, I think we've seen that urgency maybe, and this is kind of sad to say, one of the most recent times that we've experienced that I think was with Imagine No Malaria. Oh, yeah. Mm. We had that, you know, that denomination-wide mm. emphasis. Absolutely. And, and we were told that if we bought a net, we could save a life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
talk about urgency. Absolutely. Um, and making a difference. And remember the timelines? We were told um, that a person died of malaria every minute. But if we would, would join in with this, that we could cut that. And we, we cut it in half. And yeah. I remember celebrating that we had we cut that number in half. I remember the celebration at, annu- at our annual conference yes. when we went well over our goal yeah. of raising a million dollars. We, there was a, such a sense of urgency and accomplishment, a sense that we were we were doing something of eternal significance in that. So wow. those are some of those moments for us, mm. I think, when, when we have... There's so much energy and inspiration oh, yeah. in those oh, yeah. moments. Yeah. 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 You know, I also look to... And it's interesting that, that you brought up um, living in victory. And I, mm-hmm. I, didn't, I have, had not heard that language associated with either. the, yeah. the early, early classes. But um, another place that I see urgency... Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that, that maybe you, you talk about this a little bit, too, is um, in the recovery community. Yeah. Oh, right? Yeah. And yeah. Um, my family, it, it has a lot of ties in the recovery community okay. and the CR um, ministry. Um, and they talk about victory living okay. as, as, as a motto, wow. um, yeah. a, a something to aspire to. Yeah. Um, but it's true. In, in recovery ministry, um, I think in... in people who are living in recovery, mm-hmm. um, you see this sense of urgency. Yeah. It is life or death for them. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I think that in their, in their battle to overcome addiction, whatever that looks like for them, um, the urgency that they have in that battle, I think that so deeply informs mm-hmm. the urgency that they have for their faith. Yeah. And so when I look at the Methodist Church, certainly the church, the Methodist Church, which I am in contact with, uh-huh. the the part, the times, my experiences in the Methodist Church, which seem so filled with urgency, filled with life, with exuberance, so many of them have been in the recovery context. Yeah. Wow. Because of that, that it's life or death <laughs> in their battle of, over addiction, but also in their pursuit of Christ. It's the it's the same. It's it, those two. It's one and the same, and and there's just a sense of urgency there. So, uh, yeah. Now now I'm feeling convicted. So, Reverend and soon to be Reverend is is that? Nah, I, I I wouldn't say I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, I'm still working on him. I think I think the call is there, and I'm still going to push it. It, it he'll be there one okay, day. Okay, we learned last episode that the beginnings of the Wesleyan tradition were was lay a, led. Yeah. That's so right. So I'm here to lead you all, all right. as a lay person. Right. <laughs> we appreciate you. Great man. transition there. Here, here's my conviction. You talked about, and, and this is going to move into some of this complacency, and I'm talking about myself. Maybe other people are this way. You talked about folks to live in victory if they, if some, they sense someone mm-hmm. was not living in victory, they immediately started to pray. Here's my conviction. I've been in so many conversations where someone has shared something that's going on in their life that in that moment they're not living in victory, and I will say, I'll pray for you. Mm. And then sometimes I forget, Mm. or oftentimes I forget if I'm being quite honest. And and that's that's horrible. Yeah. That that and and that's on me. I don't think it's unique to me. Um, I'd like to say I hope it is, mm-hmm. but I, I I think that that we do find ourselves in in a place where we say the Christian thing, but we don't do the Christian mm-hmm. thing. What's your thoughts there? I agree. Um, Is it okay to name drop? Well, of course. Okay. Okay. So um, I remember, and this was several years ago. Only if they're a listener. Okay. Well, I. I we have billions. I will be sure that I'm sure that he is. (laughs) I remember being in um, in a restaurant with Don Hanshu several years ago. And when, and I just, I learned so much from him in that just over lunch, 
just in watching him. Mm. Because when the, when the waitress came up, he asked for their name. And then um, and engage them, not just a, oh here's my order, but really engage them. Really saw her, mm. and when she came back to the table then to um, uh, to ask if we needed anything. Anyway, I guess it was when she brought the food, mm-hmm. and he said, you know, we're getting ready to have a blessing for our food. Is there any way we can pray for you? And she, wow. and she just. There, there was something that was going on in her life, and he said, uh, well, would, it, would, would you like to just stay here while we pray? And he had prayer for her right then. Mm-hmm. And, and um, I'm telling you that story years later because of how that, how that impacted wow. me. So what would happen if rather than saying, I will pray for you, to say, can I pray for you? Just and this happened it. in a restaurant, and this was not, this wasn't allowed, you know, stand up and call attention to, to right. yourself at all. This was a very quiet prayer um, with the waitress standing and, and being a part of that and walking away with tears in her eyes because she knew someone had seen her mm. and heard her and lifted her up. Mm-hmm. So I, I think we just, we miss... Um, easy opportunities. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that those people who I, in whom I see that urgency, Don is a great mm-hmm, example. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll name drop again another, okay. another person there, Susan Arnold, yeah. yes. I think is, is the person who I look, look to mm-hmm. in, that, in that same regard. I think that urgency, sp- specifically in prayer, comes from a deep belief in, in the power of yeah. prayer, yeah. right? If, mm-hmm. and, it, and l- the logic is there. If, if I believe so deeply that prayer changes our context, mm-hmm. that, that God answers prayer in his way, it makes all the sense mm-hmm. in the world that I would be praying all right. the time, right? And, and in the same regard, if you, if you expand that some... It makes all the sense in the world that I'm going to want to tell everyone the good news, right? Right? That I'm going to want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with as many people as I can if I truly believe that it is life transforming. Mm-hmm. That w- there's nothing more urgent yeah. than that. But somehow we still lose that. We still get lost. It, it becomes mundane sometimes. Mm-hmm. We, we get so used to our religion that that we lose that urgency. How do you how do you see that? I mean what what is it that that leads us as individuals to lose that urgency? I would say for me, I get so dadgum caught up in myself mm. and mm. and the things that I determine are important. I have to do this, I have to do that. I've got this on my calendar, this schedule and that schedule and and I, I'm not intentionally making time for God. I'm not intentionally making time for others, which is just the opposite of what Jesus commanded us Mm -hmm. to do. And and I I tend to put my priorities over kingdom priorities. And and for me, I, I, I think oftentimes that has led me into a place of complacency, into a place of, I view my religion, I view my relationship with God as, uh, yeah, I have a relationship with God when it's convenient. Mm. And, and that has been a, a, a struggle for me my entire life. Um, it's easy for me to talk about it right now because I'm not in that place. And, mm-hmm. and I'm not in that place because, as we talked about mm-hmm. in our last episode, right. I'm a part of a covenant group that holds one another account, accountable. And I've spoken about the covenant group many, many mm-hmm. episodes. I don't know if I've actually ever said that we're in yeah, the covenant together. group together. Um, but uh, uh, Kim has been integral in my discipleship life. I'm 46 years old. And I know, I know, that's, that's <laughs> ancient to you young whippersnapper. Yeah. Uh, I'm 46 years old. I've been a pastor since my early 20s. And 
I believe I'm just now starting to understand discipleship and what it means to live like Jesus. And I'm not there yet. I've got a long way to go, but I'm excited about getting to where I need to go. Mm -hmm. And in the past, it was more just kind of going through the motions. Mm -hmm. Sorry to dominate that. I know no, you're our guest. No, but. no. Well, I think we know that um, that it should matter. It should make a difference. And we do a good job of talking about mm. praying and talk about reading Scripture. Um, but, uh, but I need someone. And, and Tim, you, you have, have helped me grow so much in my faith, too, mm. uh, because we're doing it together. Yes. And, and I know when we talk about accountability that I'm not... Um, you are not holding me accountable in a I'm going to get you kind of way, if, you know, or I'm going to let you know. Um, but you are, uh, you are encouraging and supporting. And when I know that I'm going to report out to my team, my, my covenant group, on, um, on where I have seen Christ at work yeah. and, and how I have been a part of that in bringing in the kingdom, uh, when I know that I get to, to share that every week, I'm going to pay more attention to it yeah. and, and be much more intentional about it. And, you know, going back to that story of the, uh, the man who told me about his mother who was in the covenant group and they asked her, are you living in victory? I, at that time, when, she, when he told me that, I just kind of took a deep breath and I said, oh, really? I said, well, how did she like that? Because I'm thinking that's kind of intrusive. Uh, and, right, yeah. And, you know, for she was a young girl and I was just imagining a, a you know, a group full <laughs> of older people. Well, are you living in victory? And, and he said, oh, she loved it. Hmm. She loved it. She, he said she never felt so cared for by any, any group of people as she did those who were a part of, of that group. I can attest to that. Yeah. Since joining our covenant group, I have had relations my entire life, right? Relationships with different people and, and things and good relationships. But I have never experienced love and, and that I am being seen. Mm -hmm. And that I have three other individuals on a week-to-week -week basis mm -hmm. that really care about my spiritual well-being, mm -hmm. about my family life, mm -hmm. about my work life. And that has just made all the yeah. difference in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that kind of intentionality <laughs> in relationship is countercultural, right? Oh, we, yeah. Mm -hmm. We've talked about that um, as, as we've gone through our discussion this, this season, that Christianity... I think at its strongest is countercultural. Mm -hmm. We are called to yeah. be set apart, and that that relationship, that intentionality, to to say, you know, to to on on both sides, the person asking and the person responding. If I say, "How are you?" and the and the default answer is, "I'm good, fine, I'm mm -hmm. fine," or "I'm busy," you know, and then, "Oh, okay, we'll move on now. We got that out of yeah. the way, <laughs> right? <laughs> right." But that's the that's that's normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. But for someone to ask. Hey Ben, how are you? And for me to say, not great right now. I'm I'm dealing with a lot of anxiety, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't feel very strong right now. Yeah, that's yeah. countercultural. Yeah, that authenticity, that intentionality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So if we expand that out a little bit and look at 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 a, the denominational level for the United Methodist Church, what does urgency look like? Or what has I it think, looked like, perhaps? Well, I think we need to be asking the question, um, is what we are doing, does it matter? Ooh. Mm. Um, does, does this have eternal significance? And if it does, then how do, we, how do we order our life as a church, as local churches, as individuals, if it, if it really has eternal significance? I'm not sure that we have that sense. Hmm. Um, you know, as we're moving into to general conference, uh, does it have eternal significance? Well, it has significance for the next book of discipline. Hmm. And for what, you know, but, but does it impact the way I live? Um, is, is that urgency there? I'm, I'm just not, I'm not sure that it is. Hmm. I mean, the urgency to get what I want in the book of discipline. 
but is there not something bigger that that we need to be uh, a, a bigger question that we need to be asking? Mm. Um, or at least when when we look at um, at at adding to the discipline or or the mm-hmm. all of the work that happens at general conference, all of that is to create structure and environment so that we mm-hmm. can mm-hmm. do ministry, so that we can advance the gospel, so that we can um, create better discipleship for, for the people at local churches. So I guess it, it's, is it is just in the mindset then of, of or, or how we frame the work that we do? Because, I mean, is the, the answer <coughs> is not the work of general conference right. is unimportant. No, no, no. <laughs> No, and I don't. I know you. I know you're not saying that. So <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. Um, for whose benefit? Mm-hmm. Maybe that's the maybe that's the question. And we may be asking the question: How how will will what happens at General Conference benefit me, or or get me what I want? Uh. Rather than how does it move us closer to to that kingdom living that that we talked about last yeah. episode. Um, Will it will it help us move move the needle to that place, and and then it takes on that eternal significance that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So if um, if urgency is the characteristic that we aspire to have to live into, um, the opposite of that might be complacency or lethargy. So. In, in our in our modern context, in our denomination, in our local church, what do those things look like? How do we see complacency in our church now? I think it, in my very long history <laughs> <laughs> in in Holston Conference, <clears throat> one of the places it, it seems to me that we lost some of our, that we, we started showing those signs mm. of lethargy and complacency <clears throat> was when we stopped counting. And that, that seems like a, you know, a very structural, well, what do you mean we stopped counting? I remember going to annual conferences when every year I knew we were going to hear the statistician's report. <clears throat> and the statistician was going to tell us how many people we we won to Christ by profession of faith in the previous year? Um, how many people left the, the church most by death? Mm-hmm. You know, how many people did we lose, and and where were we then at at the end of the year? And in the in my lifetime in ministry, that number has always every year. I, I think except one, every year that number decreased. Mm. Um, but we heard the report, and we we talked about and and worked for ways that we could uh, <clears throat> that we could increase that number of professions of faith. I don't think I've heard that report publicly spoken. Now yeah. it's in it's in our journal, yeah. but publicly spoken, we haven't had those statisticians' reports in at least sixteen years. I would say so. I, I came into the conference, my very first annual conference in Holston Conference. Uh, can I say conference, mm-hmm. conference, conference, conference more time? Okay. Um, my, my first one was 2008, and I, I do not remember hearing mm-hmm. a statistician's mm-hmm. report. Yeah. Why? why? Why is that the new norm? I think it was just, it was painful. Mm-hmm. We don't have a positive report to give. We can't put a shiny spin on it. So, so we stick our head in So let's just let's just not let's just avoid that yeah. that very negative report. Um, I've also been around long enough to remember when Bishop Chamberlain was here, mm-hmm. and I remember, and I think I was on the extended cabinet then with the Wesley Leadership Institute, but I remember him saying at the end of the year, he said, "We spent all this time." meeting as extended cabinet, planning programs, determining what our focus was going to be, all of the initiatives that we're doing. But he said at the end of the day, if we have not won new persons to faith in Christ, if if we are less at the end of the year than we were at the beginning of the year, we have failed. Mm. And and I 
I don't know that that we. I mean, to me, that's an urgent message. Um, yeah. But and and it's still an urgent message, and it is still our reality. Um, but I, I think I think for us, this focus on discipleship yeah. is is the turn, and it's the way to get to get back to that sense of urgency. I think it's going to have to begin that way. So that's one of the things the cabinet has mm-hmm. been working on is is how do we track um, what what we've been calling? We've been talking about this for several episodes what we've been calling passionate spiritual mm-hmm. disciples and passionate spiritual leaders. Um, first of all, how would you define a passionate spiritual disciple? A passionate spiritual disciple is someone who uh, who looks forward to going to church on Sunday morning and expects that when they are there, something's going to happen, that the Holy Spirit will show up, um, and not just at church on Sunday morning, but but in their day to day life, that that their relationship to Christ is one of seeking to um, to live into that kingdom mm. that Jesus modeled and that Jesus talked about. Um, that's a passionate spiritual disciple, someone who can who can talk about how they are growing in their faith, and the, and it's not a story that happened twenty years ago. Uh, or an experience they had at resurrection 30 years ago. It, it's something that, that's current and, and vital and today. That's a passionate spiritual disciple and someone who, who, is, being, who is willing to be held uh, you know, accountable to their own faith and, and is willing and able to share that with others. So what you're saying is a passionate spiritual disciple is kind of what Jesus' disciples look like. Yeah. <laughs> So, so you've often shared a story uh, yeah. about uh, the calling of the disciples and, and kind of what the, the history of a calling of a disciple is like. Will you share that story with us? Um, yeah. Um, it's one of my favorite images, and, and it goes back to, um, to the time a couple hundred years before Jesus and then, and then during the, the lifetime of Jesus when a rabbi... Um, uh, uh, was, of course, uh, known as a teacher, and they would gather students around them. And generally, it was the students who chose the rabbi they wanted to follow mm. rather than the way Jesus did it of, of cultivating his, his disciples. But as they were learning and growing from that rabbi, they did it not just by sitting in a classroom, but by actually being out on the streets with them and and watching how they, they lived their life. And, and, of course, those teachings would happen along the way, as they did in, in the Gospels. But one of the blessings that would be given uh, among, among those disciples uh, was, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. And the idea was that as they were traveling along, they would be walking so close to their rabbi that the dust that he kicked up or she kicked up on with their sandals would would fall on the disciples. Um, so what a what a what an amazing mm. blessing! May may we be may we live so close uh, to our Rabbi Jesus that that we are following and seeking to live that countercultural life mm-hmm. that he taught that he. Um, that he lived, that he modeled for us as, as that kingdom. May we walk that so close to him that we are covered in his dust, um, that we look more like Jesus today than we did yesterday, mm. or look more like him because we, we live more like him tomorrow than we did today. That's, that's how we... That's how we thrive. Absolutely. And, and that sense of urgency that Jesus had to teach the disciples to keep that mission and ministry going, yeah. if that could exist in us today, then it addresses exactly what you said, yeah. Ben, earlier in the, the, the episode, that that's when the gospel message becomes so life-giving and thriving, and that is urgent. We want to share that message. All right, we are back in the studio, and if it looks like we were wearing the same clothes in that conversation with Kim as we were in the last conversation with Kim, no, we weren't. (laughs) 
<laughs> no, we were not. Liar. Yeah. Um, man, Kim, Kim brought it again. I, yeah. the, the perspective that she brings certainly from, from the history that she's yeah. able to, to pull through and, um, and her own kind of life experience. She has, has lived a life, um, dedicated to the Methodist church. Absolutely. And, and so I think in that way, she has really able to provide so much context for us in the work that we're doing and the kind of conversations that we're having. She has been such a resource. Yeah. I want to highlight just a couple of things. One yeah. of the, the things that really jumps out to me is at the very beginning, she talks about John Wesley is taking the message to where the people are. Yeah. And man, we have missed that. Yeah. And in, in the church in general, in the United Methodist Church in Holston, in your local church, you know, maybe it's different, but in general, we have been a people that says, if we build it, they will come. Yep. And yep. maybe that worked 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Mm. We're finding it doesn't now. Yeah. Yep. And to be able to recapture what's in our roots anyway and to go to the places where where the people are and, and just be Jesus. Yeah. I mean, we don't have to go with a megaphone, right? Actually, don't have to have it'd be better if we didn't. And, uh, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. But just to, to go and, and be a part. So when you think of that, in today's world, in our modern world, how can we go to the people yeah. and, and be Jesus? Well, you know, Kim, Kim mentioned it, and, and this is a phrase, if, you've, if, you're, if you are familiar with some of our Wesleyan heritage, um, she, she brought up the... Um, Wesley, when he when he went out to do the uh, preaching in the fields, it was it was a vile yeah. a vile act a vile that, act. that he he was he finally broke down and decided to be more vile by going out and preaching in the fields. Um, so you know, I I every once in a while I've seen T-shirts that that say "Be vile," Methodism or or you know <laughs> something, and I don't. I, I don't love that right, because right. then people don't know what you're talking. Let that be very like an internal insider, voice, very not an external language. voice. Yep, you know, yep. but it's a great motto if you know what it yeah. means. But you know, I think um, last week, actually, the day that our last episode posted, uh -huh. you and I were at the Fresh Expressions conference. Yes, and I mean that whole conference, that whole movement, the idea of Fresh Expressions in the United Methodist Church is all about going where the people are. Yeah. Meeting meeting the people where they're at, um, you know, physically, mm -hmm. but also just like in their relationship with religion, with with any kind of like religious trauma that they've had. Surprise, a lot of people have religious trauma. Yeah. You know? I would say just about everyone who works for a church, who who works for a denomination the denomination, yeah. Yeah. I bet they have some degree of religious trauma. Yeah. And if you ask, they probably will tell you about it. Um, I also bet most of the people who were once uh, self-avowed Christians and are now are now not, it's it's not because they lost faith on their own. It's because the church did harm to them yep. and pushed them away. And that that group of people in in the you know, we're learning the lingo in the fresh expressions uh, world. Those would be called the duns. Yes. So you have the nuns and the duns. This was new to me. <laughs> you have the nuns and the duns. The nuns are the people who um, faith has never been a part of their life. Yeah. And the duns are people who would once call would once have called themselves Christian or um, followers of Christ in some type of you know however they classify it, but have now stepped away from that because something has happened, and almost all the time that's religious trauma. Yeah. So. I think what that looks like, this the a new model of ministry is going where the people are, yeah. both physically and also um, emotionally or um, spiritually, um, what looking at them as a as a person mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, being in relationship with them so that then you can begin to walk them towards Christ. Yeah, absolutely. We see a culture now. That is, we, we've talked about it. We, we live in a post-Christian society yep. where people by default have a skepticism of the church mm -hmm. um, <laughs> at best. <laughs> and so it doesn't work to go knocking on doors telling people, you know, 
you're gonna you're gonna if you die today are you going to hell like obviously we know that doesn't work but that used to be the model that used to be the way church was done and i think there's probably a lot that could be said that that was a successful model of ministry sure However, that is so clearly not the context that we live in today. Right. So we need to adapt the way that we do ministry. Maybe we haven't really done that very well. Yeah. And and I think another big thing about it is um, some of the things that we saw in Fresh Expressions. um, um, I'll bring up one. It was was like a bar church or or brew theology. Brew theology. um, and, And what happened in this one particular story that we heard was uh, a pastor, and uh, actually a professor, uh, went into uh, a, a bar area, and uh, because one of her parishioners attended the church, it may have been the person that that owned the bar or ran the bar or I don't or managed think so. Or, it was just someone who a regular. Okay, and long story short, uh, they were having conversation. Another group of people kind of overheard the conversation ended up kind of sliding over, getting involved. Every single person in that other group was done. Yep. They, they were people that had been wounded by the church and was not going to go back to the church. But that didn't mean they didn't have uh, a, a sense or a need for God. It, it wasn't because they didn't believe in God. It, it was a, we're not going back to the church because that's too painful. Yeah. Again, long story short, they ended up asking this person if she would basically do a group with them. Yeah. Um, and um, it didn't start as a Bible study. It was just, hey, let's kind of talk about this whole this God thing. And it grew and grew and grew. And now these folks are uh, living a life, uh, being the hands and feet of Jesus. And it cost her... Nothing. I mean, from be, a financial a costs standpoint, like five or six dollars. Okay, <laughs> true. But she was getting that anyway. Sure, that's fair. That that's true. She she was there getting that anyway. So, uh, you know, these things that we do sometimes when we think about new ministries, we think, well, we can't really do it because it costs so much to. to yeah. It yeah. doesn't necessarily have to, and especially if you're going to the people, and you're just living an authentic life for Jesus. People are going to recognize, and people are going to to see that and want to be a part of it. We've seen that from the beginning of Jesus's ministry. Mm. And last thing on this, uh, you said it's it's new kind of going out to the people, yeah. but as Kim reminded us, that's how we got started. Yeah, yeah. Because John was going out into the fields and preaching and people were hearing about this, uh, that's how our whole denomination became into existence. And, uh, man, if we can grab hold of those roots, something yeah. mighty could happen. Absolutely. All right. Another, yep. another thing that, that came from that history, that early, um, early Wesleyan tradition, um, Kim brought up that in those class meetings – they would start by saying, are you living in victory? Oh, my gosh. That story. I know. I mean, and, and she even admitted it. What, what would you say? If I mean, first of all, it's none of your business how I'm living. Yeah. But, <laughs> I mean, you. What, what a tough thing. But we, we don't ask questions like that anymore. Yeah. That kind of, from the start of, of our Wesleyan tradition that accountability. Yeah. And, and then you, you know, you and Kim got to bounce back and forth and talk all about your discipleship group, your, um, the, the kind of accountability that you provide for each other. Um, that we, we see that now from the beginning yep. of, from, from the Wesley brothers, we see a need for that now. And I don't think we do so well at that. This kind of this, we, when we live into this place of, um, complacency, yeah. of stagnation, where we're just kind of going with the status quo, going through the motions. This is religion is just part of what I do. I'm I'm a Christian, yep. so check that box. You know, we we that doesn't include any kind of accountability. Right, that doesn't include any kind of um, checking in authentically with the people that you're in community with. And then, I mean, she said 
if they didn't feel like they were living in victory, what did they do? They stopped and prayed for that person immediately. Because it was so important. Yeah. We talk all the time. I'm, I'm one of the, the onboarders uh, within the Holston Conference where we go when new pastors are transitioning to churches and we help onboard them into this new yep. ministry. Yep, yep. And, and we always ask the church, what's your DNA? What's your culture? What is it that you're known for? And without fail, every single church with big smiles on their face say, we're a friendly church. Mm. And that's great. That's that's great. Uh, we're a church that welcomes people. Okay. That's great. But one of the things that blew my mind hmm. at the conference was from uh, Reverend Dr. Rodrigo Cruz. Oh, yeah. Who is a speaker at this year's convocation that's yeah. coming up in a couple of weeks. If, if Clergy, if you're not signed up for that, Man, you got to get signed up because it's hey, it's going to be awesome. If you're outside awesome. Holston, hit us up. I mean, we find space for absolutely, you. absolutely. <laughs> um, he he said people will come, people will visit when they are welcomed, mm-hmm. but they stay when they're valued. Oof. And we just think through these past 10, 15 years at our memberships roles that continue to decline. Now, one of the reasons they mm-hmm. continue to decline is um, our core group of people in that baby boomer generation are, are beginning to pass away. And one of the things our churches are not doing are replacing folks that, that pass away. We're, we're not bringing in new people. Mm-hmm. And I think a big reason for that is because we're not valuing the people for who they are. Mm. Instead, we are we are focused on this is who we are. Come be like us. And, and when we do that, we very quickly move back into that survive mentality. Because mm. if you don't value a person, the person is not going to stay. And if they're not staying, then we're going to continue to be in that survive mentality as our members yeah. get older and and go on to glory. Yeah. One of my one of the things that just kept echoing in my mind from from the Fresh Expressions conference um, and it it wasn't something that any of the presenters said it's just like this thought that I had. I mean, I don't know if it was something I was dealing with or if like spirit put it on me, I don't know, but this this and I I wrote it down. Um, was I kept, it the uh, the midnight burritos? <laughs> it wasn't the midnight burritos. Um, I kept asking myself, why do we grieve the loss of those who choose to leave but overlook the uh, ones we never allowed in and continue to exclude? Yeah. I mean, it's just like time after time, all of the work of Fresh Expressions is about reaching people who who we have excluded in the past. Yeah. About making space and and... and Eliminating the parts of our of our um, uh, our structure of, of our identity, which pushed those people away. Yeah, it's about making making relationship with those people. Why is it that as a denomination, as churches, as individuals, we continue to be focused on the people who choose to leave our congregation, and we do everything we can to p- to keep the people in our church who keep threatening to leave yeah. and we continue to exclude and persecute and vilify the people who we could be bringing in, accepting into the body of Christ yeah, yeah, or who are already have relationship with Christ, but for some reason don't feel accepted in our church body. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's tough um, I, I find myself in in a, a, a grieve and let's move on pattern a, a, a lot. And and when I think of of grieving uh, folks that that have left for disaffiliation reasons, uh, I, I think of my my close friends. I, I think of the people that I've been in ministry with. But the point that you are you're making is, what about the ones that want to be a part? What about the ones that that want to to come in, help us reinvigorate ministry, and be the hands and feet of Jesus? And I, I think you're right. I, I, I think that as, as our friends, as our close loved ones have have left the church, 
it's it's definitely time to bless them and the ministries that they're going to be a part of and for us to focus on the ministries that we need to be a part yeah, of. Yeah, and acknowledge the bridges that we have burned Yes. beyond repair. Yes. We, as a denomination, we have done an incredible amount of harm to a whole bunch of different people groups. Yeah. And the work of repairing those relationships is probably a generational challenge. Oh, absolutely. It is not something that we're going to solve on this podcast. Yeah. It's not something we're going to solve probably in our lifetimes. Yeah. There are entire groups of people that have turned away from the church, and I don't blame them at all. Sure. Because we're the ones that pushed them away. Yeah. We're, we're very good at that. Mm. Uh, un- unfortunately, we're, we're very good, again, at wanting people to be the way we want them to be rather than accepting them for who they are and being open to how Jesus can use them to be his hands and feet. Well, uh, let's, get, let's get back on, yeah, on, yep. uh, on, on script a little bit. We talked a lot about prayer yes. with Kim. Yeah. Um, and I want to I wanna bring that up especially because we, we filmed that interview with Kim yeah. um, three weeks ago now. Uh-huh. Um, and she talked about a memory she had from many years ago yeah. with one of our, our loyal rebranders. I've been told he, he listens to our, our podcast, um, Don Hanshu. Reverend Don Hanshu. The, the Hanshu. Reverend Don Hanshu. The Reverend. Um, a, a good friend and, and mentor of mine. My membership is at his church, so he's my, he's my pastor. Yeah. Um, she shared a story about him praying for, for them at a meal and yep. prayed for their waitress um, because she, she shared some things that she was going through at the time mm-hmm. um, and that that was clearly very impactful for her. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the thing that was impactful was not that he said he would pray for her, but that he prayed for her yes. <laughs> in the moment, in right? The, moment. the same way that what that that Wesley um, had led his people to pray for those who didn't feel like they were living in victory, right? Right, right. The same day that Kim shared that story, we were down here in the studio, first floor of the conference office, and we finished. And I went upstairs along with you and Kim. We had another meeting that we were all three a part of. They were some of them were getting out of a meeting that Don Hanshu was here for. Yep. Don Hanshu stops me in the hall. He says, Ben, how you doing? What's going on? And I shared with him some stuff that I had been struggling with. I was, I was not in a great spot, um, was dealing with some like anxiety and just feeling kind of like spent and I didn't have a, a really great place to recharge. Yeah. And I shared that with him and he said, can I pray for you? Yeah. And in the hallway, I was late for the meeting. In the hallway, with all these people walking past, rushing by to get to this next meeting, Don Hanshu just stops and, and prays for me. If that's not a sign yeah, yeah. that, like, yeah. are you kidding me? Yeah. Not only did someone go out of their way and pray for me in the same way that Kim, but it was the same person. Same guy. Same guy. I mean, and, shout out and, Don Hanshu, but also like that's a God moment. Absolutely. Like and, that's clearly God working through Don Hanshu. Yeah. And, and that gives us the modern day example of are you living in victory? Yeah. He didn't ask the, that question, but he asked you how you were doing and he meant it. It yeah. wasn't, hey, Ben, how you doing and walk away. It yeah. was, I want to know. And then in the moment, you were vulnerable with him. And he continued to minister. He continued being that authentic, passionate, spiritual disciple that, that we've yeah. been talking about. And it's things like that that when, when people hear about and when people see and when people experience, they say, I want to be a part of that. Yeah. And, and all he did was just live the life that Jesus has called him to live. And he was just being his true, authentic self. And, and that was another thing that we heard uh, tons of time at um, Fresh Expressions Conference was people want to be able to be their true, authentic self and be seen, be known, be loved. And I, I think that's what Jesus, I, I think that's what his ministry was all about. Yeah. He saw those that others did not see and, uh, and ministered to them. And that's what we're called to do. Mm. All right, another one. Um, 
you know, when we ask him uh, how to move from uh, or move to urgency, um, she said the best thing or, or maybe one of the things to do is to ask the question, what are we doing and does it have eternal significance? And yeah. I thought, good night. That, that could clear up so many things that we're a part of. Yeah. It's just to stop for a moment, take inventory, and then say, is this really making a difference for the kingdom? Mm-hmm. And, and if it's not, give it up. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and let's move on and let's find that thing that my church, that my life, that I'm passionate about to, to be able to, to make a difference. Yeah. What well, would you think? Yeah, and, and I think it's the farther away you get from, um, from you know, in the trenches ministry, from, from building relationship with people, the, the harder it is, but the more necessary, I think it is, to ask that question. So, yeah. right, like Kim talked about it, that, that um, a lot of the discipleship originally happened on the lay level. Yes. Right? It yep. was lay yep. it was lay leaders who were leading the the discipleship um, efforts. And and then so if you bring that to the modern context, it's we have those lay leaders in the mm-hmm. church. Local churches have pastors who are still very involved in the ministry development of individuals and of their congregation. As we move up to the conference level, it's a lot harder sometimes to stay focused on that is what I'm doing really, does it really matter? Is it really consequential? Is it really advancing? Does it have eternal significance, yep. right? Yep. Because you and I sit in all these meetings, yes. t- planning and visioning and, and preparing and setting policy and guidelines and all of this stuff. And, and so often we, we don't really ask that question. Yeah. Does this have eternal significance? Does this matter? Why am I doing this? Why are we as a group spending all of our time and effort and money doing all of this work? Does it matter? Right. Sometimes the answer is yes. There is a, there is structure is necessary. Yes. Policy necessary. Planning necessary. But is this the best way I can be using my time? And Am I creating these structures, these policies, this planning for the right reasons? Yep. So at the conference level, is the work that I do creating an environment for others to lead people into the presence of God? Is the content that I produce creating encounters with the Holy Spirit? Right. The work that I do, that you do, that we do on the conference level, on the, on the denominational level, is that it probably isn't directly impacting faith. Sometimes it is, but more often it is setting the scene. It's creating atmosphere and environment for others to do that relational yep. work. Yep. So I think we just have to ask on the structural level, like, is that, is that our intent? Is that our purpose in doing this? Otherwise, if we're just doing this because this, maybe that's what we're supposed to do or right. because... Right this is how we maintain the structure that we have, or those are not good enough reasons. Yeah. So stop doing that. Jesus didn't tell his disciples, this is what you do. Jesus went and showed them, and then he said, why don't you do this with me? I believe that you can. And that's how Kim wrapped up her her por- portion of the, the video, telling us um, uh, about the rabbis and the disciples following so closely that they're covered in in the rabbi's dust. And that should be what we strive for, uh, not just talk about. And, and that's hard. That can be really hard because for a lot of us, we didn't have that example. The example that we had was the, the pastor telling us what to do. Yep. And, and so when we went into ministry, that's we, we just kind of picked up on that. And that's been going on for many, many generations, and we have to break that. And we have the opportunity to break that and get back into the, the, the trenches of ministry and, and go and do. And again, it goes all the way back to what we started with in the fresh expressions and, and what Kim said, like John Wesley, we go to the people, not wait for the people to come to us. Yeah, yeah. 
I this you just brought something else up for me. Um, we keep a lot of <laughs> a lot of today has been responding to the Fresh Expressions conference. Yeah. I'm okay with that. It was it was impactful. Yeah. Um, there was a a um, there was a worship moment where an artist was on stage uh, doing a, a, a dance, um, and it was the song that. It was, I mean, it, I hadn't heard this version of the song, but it, it brought in the There is Power in the Name of Jesus song, um, the Break Every Chain, that mm-hmm. song. Um, but then it, it had kind of a, a different uh, refrain, and it talked all about cycles. Yeah. So God has the power to break cycles. Yeah. And, and God will break cycles in me, in my life. Um, man, it was powerful. I want to find a recording of it. I'm sure there is one. Um, but it... it it talk in in the words and and in the the motions that this artist was 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 acting out talked about how um, like there are cycles of violence or cycles of um, dead Christianity like you know like going through the motions right. the kind of stuff we're talking about and um, that like as as people as individuals we are a part of that that. Um, cyclical process. Yeah. I mean, we, that's just how, how people yeah. are made. Right. And so in anything that we do, we bring in our past mm-hmm. and, and we bring in that, um, w- wherever we are on that cycle. Right. And so we have to acknowledge that I am a product of my environment, of my upbringing, of the faith mentors that I've had in my life. And so the way that I, my faith, the way I engage in faith, the way I lead others into faith, is defined in large part by my past, by yeah. what I know. Yeah. And so if there are things that I can now see are broken in what I was taught, it's my responsibility to break that cycle yes. and to do something new, to acknowledge that this is, if I don't, if I'm not conscious about it, if I'm not intentional about it, that's going to be my default. Yep. If I don't, if I don't intentionally choose to, to turn to, to do something different, I'm going to fall back on those things that I already know are not working. Yep. So I need to be doubly intentional about doing things in new ways that are um, informed by my current context, yep. not by my past and what I grew up learning how to do things. Yeah, and, and, and a big part of that, as we talked about earlier, it is that Christian community. Yeah, that that covenant group, someone, uh, you know, if you just try to break those cycles on your own, it's it's so much easier to fall back into those habits. But if you've got someone that sees you like you were talking about with Don, like Kim and I talked about in the covenant group and, and reminds you that you're loved and even will hold you accountable to, to say, hey, how you doing? Mm. Not not in a judgmental way, but in a way that we want you to live in victory. Yep. Then then that that is easier. It's not easy, but it's easier mm. to begin to break those patterns and those chains and those cycles to move to um, what we need to be moving toward. Yeah, definitely. All right, as we begin to to wrap this up, one of the things that that we, we want to be sure that we talk about uh, are ways to get involved. And we've mentioned some of those practical ways to think about fresh expressions. Definitely check that out. Uh, you can, if you're part of Holston Conference, you can talk to the Reverend Dr. Susan uh, Arnold and or your district superintendent, and they can give you some information. Um, but one of the things that I, I love to think about is th- that uh, lingo that's been going around now for a little bit called fail forward. Okay. And um, to fail forward means we try something, maybe it doesn't work, but we learn and we, we move uh, and, and we go to that next thing. We're always looking to get better and we're always looking for things, but we're not afraid to try something because we get stuck and we get complacent and then we start surviving. And, and so to fail forward means, hey, we're going to take this risk, and if it doesn't work, that's okay. We are a people that are scared of failure, and that's kind of a natural thing. But I want to give you something to think about, to put a little twist on that. 
if we look at our denomination, at our hosting conference over the last 30 years, what's happening? We're declining. We're declining. So if, if we're declining, which means we're not growing, which means we're not creating more disciples, which is our mission statement, that means we're failing. Yeah. So if we're already failing, why not fail forward? Why not try something to mm. break that cycle yeah. and, 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 and get with other churches? Let's live into being this connectional system mm. that, that we claim to be and find out what we can do together for the benefit of the community, for the benefit of the kingdom. That's a great place. That's a great place to leave it. I like that. I think that's a, that is a challenge for us as individuals, but it's a, it, it's a challenge for our structures as well. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yep. Mm. All right. So as we begin to, to wrap up, where do we want people to go? All right. We got, the list is growing. I'll it be honest. Is. So, it is. I mean, the number one spot, you can go to our website, rebrandpodcast.com. Okay. Um, you follow us on Instagram, rebrand underscore pod. Search for us on Facebook at rebrand podcast, YouTube, rebrand podcast, or you can email us at rebrand at holston.org. Way to go. And what do they do when they get to those places? I mean, so many things. There's all kinds of additional content yeah. to watch. Um, you can give us feedback. I mean, we shared a couple pieces of feedback earlier yeah. in the episode. Maybe you get featured. Um, all kinds of ways that you can interact and be a part of this conversation. They can. What do they do to that button? You can smash that subscribe button. That's hit right. that follow button. Uh, like. You can like all the things. Ring that bell. <laughs> that's, what the, that's what the kids say. You know, all the, all the things. Well, we are so glad that you have been with us. Uh, again, we are going to put out some extra content this week. We've got some interviews that uh, here pretty soon you'll hear from uh, Bishop Looney. That's right. Uh, you will also hear some clips from uh, Reverend Dr. Rodrigo Cruz that we mentioned earlier. And, and we're just excited about some of this content. Uh, we're uh, on our way uh, by the time you're watching this, we will have been in Greece for a while. We're going to grab baby. some some content from there. Uh, maybe not part of Rebrand, but we will be putting it on Holston.org to let yeah. you know some of the studies Definitely. and things that are, are going on. So a lot of things going on, yep. and we're excited Stay about Stay tuned it. for all of that. We've got a whole lot more coming. Until next time, be sure to be covered in the dust of Jesus. Bye. Bye. You were ready. I was ready. You were ready. I was ready.